and suddenly our bands seemed to be murdering our bands, and it was almost too much for people in a very caring city. A shocking tale starts in a small town named Scottswood. In 1968, Mary Bell, a little child, does a terrible act. Even though she was only 11 years old, her terrifying behavior shocked everyone. As a child, Mary Bell wasn't only naughty. She did something much worse. Her actions resulted in the tragic deaths of two children. People couldn't believe what they were hearing. Just why would a little kid act in such a way? Could it be her upbringing? Or was there another factor at play? We discover an incident of deep sorrow, disbelief, and emotion as we explore Mary Bell's life. Stay with us as we explore. This gripping story looks into the lives of Britain's youngest girl, revealing a terrifying crime, a devastated childhood, and the consequences of a tragic decision. Mary Bell committed two dreadful murders, but her case does give us hope that children can change. In the peaceful suburb of Scottswood, a chilling tale unfolded in 1968. A young girl, Mary Flora Bell, born on May 26, 1957, committed an act so shocking that it would forever be etched in the annals of crime history. At the tender age of 10, Mary committed her first manhunt mission, preying on two unsuspecting preschool age boys. In a chillingly calculated manner, Mary would tell her victims they had a sore throat, offering to massage it, only to strangle them mercilessly. The community was in shock and disbelief as the terrifying reality that had replaced childhood innocence shattered it. Mary, 11, was tried at Newcastle Assizes in December 1968 and found guilty of homicide, becoming Britain's youngest female killer. Her acts were considered to have been driven by diminished responsibility, and she was diagnosed with psychopathic personality disorder prior to the trial. Mary was released from prison in 1980 at the age of 23, and the law granted her permanent anonymity, which has now been extended to protect the names of her daughter and granddaughter. Mary's true identity is unknown to the public, as she goes by several identities. However, the haunting memories of her crimes serve as a grim warning of the darkness that might emerge unexpectedly. The first time I met Mary Bell, I felt that something bad could happen involving this girl. Mary Bell's mother, Elizabeth Betty Bell, was frequently absent, leaving her children alone while working in Glasgow. Mary, her second child, was born when Betty was 17, and her father's name remains unknown. Although Mary assumed William Billy Bell, renowned for his aggressive personality and criminal past, was her father, concerns arose when he married Betty after Mary's birth, raising questions about her biological father. Mary was a child who was not wanted and was often ignored. Her aunt, Isa McCricket, said that right after Mary was born, Betty didn't want to hold her. She told the hospital staff, take the thing away from me. Mary, who lives at 70 White House Road, had several incidents as a baby or a young girl while alone with her mother, Betty. This created fears among the family that Betty was ignoring or intentionally injuring Mary. Mary was dumped from a first floor window in 1960, given sleeping medication, and even sold to a childless woman. Catherine, Mary's older sister, had to rescue her from across Newcastle on her own and bring her home. According to Mary Bell's own accounts, her mother involved her in adult activities from a very young age, though this claim remains unconfirmed by family members. They were aware, however, that Mary's young life had been marked by tragedy. She had witnessed her five-year-old friend being fatally hit by a bus. Betty denied her family's repeated offers to take care of Mary as a result of her negligence and cruelty. Betty, who was known for engaging in allegedly subjected Mary to inappropriate environments in the mid-1960s, including unpleasant and destructive activities. Mary Bell's distant and manipulative behavior frequently bordering on hostility, by the age of 10 did not surprise anyone who knew her unhappy past. However, there are undoubtedly more unspoken truths from Mary's turbulent background, leaving a mystery about her life. Mary exhibited unpredictable behavior, including signals of distress, both at home and at school. She had extreme mood swings, was constantly bedwetting, and interacted aggressively with other children. Mary frequently clashed with her peers and attempted to hurt them, such as blocking a small girl's throat with sand, which made many youngsters fearful of her. She often spent her free time with Norma Joyce Bell, a 13-year-old girl who lived next door. They became friends in early 1967. Despite sharing the same last name, they were not related. By 1968, Mary's Delaval Road Junior School classmates had become habituated to her erratic behavior. They recognized signs of distress in her, such as shaking her head or giving an angry stare, which indicated that danger was on its way. 
Those who received her focus glare frequently became her next target of aggression. But what was causing these sudden changes in Mary's behavior? And who would be her next victim? These questions left everyone on edge. On May 11th, in the same year, a disturbing incident occurred in Scott's Wood. The three-year-old kid was found injured and alone in an old air raid shelter where he had been playing with Mary and Norma Bell. He claimed he was pushed off the roof but couldn't tell which girl did it. Furthermore, three sets of parents informed the police that Mary and Norma had attempted to injure their children in a sand pit on the same day. And calls to the police uh, were very frequent for her to respond to fights in the house. Although the girls denied pushing the boy, Norma confessed that Mary attempted to choke them, asking what would happen if she did. Authorities were notified, however, due to the girls' young age, they were only warned and no further action was taken. I believe that people have the propensity to be bad when they are born, and Mary Bell was one of these people. In the midst of these scary events, another girl came into the picture. Her name was Norma Bell, but she was not related to Mary. She was 13 when the incident happened. Norma found herself mixed up in this scary story. She played a big part in the investigation that followed. Norma and Mary were friends, and Norma ended up helping Mary. She became the key that the police needed to solve the case. What made Norma help Mary Bell? Was it because she wanted to fit in? We may never know, but one thing is clear. Norma Bell played a part in these terrible crimes. I just don't think the the law, the, the police and all the government had any idea what to do with these girls. On the day before her 11th birthday, May 25th, 1968, a chilling event took place. Mary Bell, a young girl, took the life of four-year-old Martin Brown. The scene was a deserted house at 85 St. Margaret's Road. It's believed she committed this horrifying act alone. Around 3.30 p.m., three children discovered Martin's lifeless body. He was lying on his back, arms stretched out above his head. A few specks of blood and foam around his mouth were the only signs of his tragic end. John Hall, a local worker, tried to bring him back to life, but his efforts were in vain. As Hall was trying to save Martin, Mary Bell, known as May, and her friend Norma Bell, who was 13, showed up at the bedroom door. They were quickly sent away. They then went to Martin's aunt, Rita Finley, and told her, one of your sister's kids had an accident. We think it's Martin, but we can't be sure because he's covered in blood. The next day, Bernard Knight did an autopsy on Martin's body. He couldn't find any signs of violence, so he couldn't say how Martin died. He did rule out the idea that Martin died from eating pills. On June 7th, the court couldn't decide how Martin died and left the case open. This left everyone wondering what really happened to Martin. In 1968, the close-knit community of Scottswood in Newcastle was torn apart by the brutal of two young boys. On a fateful afternoon on July 31st, 1968, a three years old boy named Brian Howe was seen for the last time. He was playing outside his house with his sibling, their pet dog, and two girls, Mary Bell and Norma Bell. When Brian didn't come home that afternoon, his worried family and neighbors started looking for him. Late that night at 11.10 p.m., a search party found Brian's body hidden between two big concrete blocks. The first policeman to reach the scene saw that someone had tried to hide Brian's body under grass and weeds. Brian's lips were blue, and there were several bruises and scratches on his neck. A pair of broken scissors were found near his feet. The coroner said that Brian had been strangled. He had been dead for about seven and a half hours before his body was found. The culprit had closed Brian's nostrils with one hand and strangled him with the other. Before Brian died, someone had hurt his legs, cut his hair, hurt his and tried to carve the letter uh, M into his stomach. The coroner thought that another child must have caused the death of Brian because not much force was used. Strange gray and maroon fibers were found on Brian's clothes and shoes. These fibers didn't come from any clothes in Brian's house. They must have come from the culprit. This left everyone wondering who could have done such a thing. What made the killings even more shocking was that their attacker was 10-year-old Mary Bell, herself just a child. On May 25th, the day before her 11th birthday, a horrifying event took place. Mary Bell strangled four years old Martin Brown in an abandoned house in Scottswood, England. She left the scene only to return with her friend Norma Bell to find that two local boys had already discovered the body. The police were baffled. 
Other than a bit of blood and saliva on Martin's face, there were no clear signs of violence. An empty bottle of painkillers found near the body led the police to assume that Martin had accidentally overdosed. They ruled his death an accident. But was it really? Days after Martin's death, Mary Bell showed up at the Browns' doorstep asking to see Martin. His mother gently told her that Martin was no longer alive, but Mary insisted she knew that and wanted to see his body. Shocked and appalled, Martin's mother shut the door on her. Soon after, Mary and her friend Norma broke into a nursery school. They left notes claiming responsibility for Martin's death and vowing to hit again. The police dismissed the notes as a sick joke. The nursery school, tired of the constant break-ins, decided to install an alarm system. But the question remains, were these just empty threats or a chilling promise of what was to come? A few nights later, Mary and Norma were found at the school. They were just hanging around outside when the police showed up, so they were let go. Meanwhile, um, Mary Bell was telling her classmates that she had caused the death of Martin Brown. But because she was known for making things up and showing off, no one believed her. That was until another young boy was found dead. Before she was caught, the press had started calling Bell the Tyneside Strangler. Well, two months after the first murder, on July 31st, Mary Bell and her friend Norma took the life of three years old Brian Howe. This time, Bell did something even more horrifying. She used scissors to hurt Brian's body. When Brian's sister started looking for him, Mary and Norma offered to help. They searched the neighborhood, and Mary even pointed out the concrete blocks where Brian's body was hidden. But Norma said he wouldn't be there, and Brian's sister moved on. When Brian's body was finally found, the neighborhood was in a state of panic. Now two little boys were dead. The police talked to the local children, hoping someone had seen something that could help find the culprit. The police were shocked when they got the coroner's report. As Brian's blood cooled, new marks appeared on his chest. Someone had used to scratch the letter M onto his skin. There was another disturbing detail. The attack didn't seem to have been very forceful, which suggested that the cause of Brian's death might have been a child. During their interviews with the police, Mary and Norma didn't do a good job uh, of hiding their interest in the investigation. Norma seemed excited and Mary was evasive, especially when the police mentioned that she had been seen with Brian Howe on the day he died. On the day of Brian's funeral, Mary was seen hanging around outside his house. She even laughed and clapped her hands when she saw his coffin. The investigators called Mary back for another interview. Sensing that they were closing in on her, Mary concocted a story. She claimed to have seen an eight-year-old boy hit Brian on the day he died. She said the boy had been carrying a pair of broken scissors, but this was Mary Bell's downfall. The details about the scissors used to harm Brian's body were a closely guarded secret. It was known only to the investigators and one other person, the one who had taken Brian's life. Under more intense questioning, both Norma and Mary couldn't hold up. Norma started to work with the police and pointed the finger at Mary. Mary admitted she was there when Brian Howe was the cause of death, but tried to shift the blame onto Norma. So, what turns a child into a cold-blooded and at what age should they be accountable for their actions? The finding of Brian Howe's body set off a massive search. More than 100 detectives from all over Northumberland were put on the case, and over 1,200 children were questioned about where they were by August 2nd. Two of the children questioned on August 1st were Mary Bell and Norma Bell. Witnesses told investigators that they had seen the girls playing with Brian just before he was thought to have died. In her first interview, Norma seemed excited while Mary was more watchful and quiet. Both girls admitted to playing with Brian on the day he died, but they said they hadn't seen him after lunchtime. The day after questioning, Mary claimed to have seen a local eight-year-old boy play with Brian on July 31st, detailing that he hit Brian and the boy was covered in grass and weeds as if he had been rolling in a field and had scissors with a broken or bent leg. This detail, known only to the police, led Detective Chief Inspector James Dobson to suspect Mary of the real homicide. However, the local youngster was found to have been at Newcastle International Airport on the same day, and witnesses confirmed his parents' account, clearing him of any involvement in Brian's death. On the afternoon of August 4th, Norma Bell's parents reached out to the police. They said Norma wanted to share what she knew about Brian Howe's death. DCI Dobson came to their home and formally warned Norma before asking her what she knew. Norma then told Dobson that Mary had taken her to a spot on the Tin Lizzie where she had shown her Brian's body. Mary had shown her how she had strangled the child. 
According to Norma, Mary had told her she enjoyed strangling the child. She then described how she had marked his stomach with a razor blade, which had been hidden at the crime scene, and the broken scissors. Norma then showed the police the crime scene and where the razor blade was hidden. A drawing Norma made of the wounds on the boy's stomach matched exactly what the coroner had described. Norma then recalled, May said, the blocks, Norma, away, and we went to the concrete blocks. Uh, then May said to Brian, lift up your neck. Just then, some boys were playing nearby and Lassie, Brian Howe's dog, was barking. She had followed us down. May then said, get away or I'll set the dog on you. The boys left. May said to Brian again, lift up your neck. This was a part of Norma Bell's confession to the police on August 4th, 1968. In the early hours of August 5th, Mary Bell was visited at her home. When faced with the inconsistencies in her previous statement, she became notably defensive. She told the detectives, you're trying to brainwash me. I will get a lawyer to get me out of this. Later that day, Norma confessed to being present when Mary strangled Brian. According to Norma's statement, while they were alone, Mary attempted to strangle Brian before asking Norma to take over, claiming her hands were fatigued. Norma flees the scene, leaving Mary with Brian. Further investigation indicated that fibers from Mary's woolen clothing matched those found on Brian's body, and Brian's shoes complemented Norma's maroon skirt. Furthermore, identical fibers were found on the body of another victim, Martin Brown. For Mary doing this, is it gave her a sense of power over young children. And there may be some significance about the fact that it was two young boys. On August 7th, 1968, Brian Howe was laid to rest in a local cemetery. Over 200 people attended the ceremony. DCI Dobson, who had plans to arrest both girls later that day, noticed Mary Bell standing outside the Howe household as the child's coffin was being carried out. He later recalled, she stood there laughing and clapping her hands. I thought, I must bring her in. She might do this again. That evening at 8 p.m., both girls were formally charged with ending the life of Brian Howe. Mary's response to the charge was chillingly casual. That's all right by me. Norma, on the other hand, broke down in tears, exclaiming, I never, I'll pay you back for this. In a written confession witnessed by an unbiased observer, Mary admitted to being present at Brian Howe's homicide, but blamed it on Norma. Mary also admitted to breaking into Woodland Crescent Nursery with Norma the day following Martin Brown's death, vandalizing the property and leaving four handwritten notes. Following their imprisonment, psychological testing found that Norma had a slow learning speed and a gentle attitude with a tendency to exhibit emotions. Mary, on the other hand, demonstrated intelligence as well as craftiness, as seen by mood swings and defensive behavior during interactions. Four psychiatrists who examined Mary concluded that while she didn't have a mental disorder, she did have a psychopathic personality disorder. In his official report for the Director of Public Prosecutions, David Westbury concluded, Mary's social skills are basic and often involve automatic denial trying to please others, manipulation, complaining, bullying, running away, or violence. The trial of Mary Bell and Norma Bell for ending the lives of Martin Brown and Brian Howe started at Newcastle Assizes on December 5th, 1968. Both girls stood before Mr. Justice Cusack and a jury, and both pleaded not guilty to the charges. R.P. Smith, QC, represented Norma, while Harvey Robson, QC, represented Mary. Despite protests from both defense lawyers on the first day of the trial, the judge decided to waive the girls' right to anonymity because of their age. This meant that the media could share the names, ages, and photos of both girls. Throughout the trial, each girl sat in the middle of the court next to plainclothed female police officers behind their lawyers and close to their families. During the trial, Rudolph Lyons, QC, representing the government, presented a six-hour opening statement that prepared the jury for the very difficult task ahead due to both their young age and the severity of the crimes. He described the government's approach to showing similarities between the two victims, indicating the involvement of the same perpetrator. Lyons provided evidence for both deaths, claiming the accused were guilty. Despite Mary's dominance, Lyons alleged that both girls acted together and were equally guilty of ending the lives of the children for the thrill of it. On day five of the trial, Norma testified in her defense, denying direct involvement in either homicide while acknowledging Mary's aggressive inclinations and conversations about attacking and taking the lives of children. During cross-examination, Norma confessed to observing Mary's attack on Brian Howe, but did not intervene. 
citing uncertainty about the circumstances. She denied hurting the child herself. After Norma's testimony concluded on December 12th, Mary testified in her own defense. Her testimony, which lasted almost four hours, was briefly paused when she began crying in a policewoman's arms. She denied Norma's accusations, insisting that although she had seen Martin Brown's body at St. Margaret's Road, she had never harmed the child. She also admitted that she and Norma had later asked the boy's mother to view his body because they were daring each other and one of us did not want to be a chicken. Mary also admitted that she had told others that her knowledge of Martin's death could get Norma straight away. When questioned about Brian Howe's death, Mary claimed that Norma was the one who had strangled the child. She said she was just standing and looking. I couldn't move. It was as if some glue was pulling us down. Mary then alleged that Norma had encouraged Brian to lie down if he wanted some sweets, telling him, you've got to lie down for the lady to come with the sweets, before proceeding to strangle him with her bare hands while she herself unsuccessfully tried to stop the attack. Mary further stated that she could tell how much force Norma was using because her fingertips and nails were going white. She again admitted that she had failed to inform authorities of her knowledge of Norma's actions out of both fear and a misguided sense of loyalty. During the trial, Norma's mother, Catherine, testified about a horrific event in which Mary attempted to strangle Norma's younger sister, Susan, only to be stopped by Catherine's husband. Ian Frazier, a child psychiatrist, testified that despite Norma's young mental age and limited awareness of good and wrong, she was capable of comprehending the criminal nature of the conduct she was charged with. On December 13th, Norma's defense lawyer, R.P. Smith, highlighted the absence of strong proof against her, claiming that Mary's accusations were the primary reason for her involvement. Smith encouraged the jury to keep their emotions separate and not hold both girls accountable for the actions of one another, emphasizing the necessity of fairness in their deliberations. During his closing argument for Mary, Harvey Robson described her problematic upbringing, unstable family, and the blurred surroundings between the real and the imaginary in her mind. He referenced the testimony of David Westbury, a defense witness who diagnosed Mary with a major personality problem caused by delayed mental development influenced by hereditary and environmental factors. Robson highlighted the messages left by both girls after Martin Brown's death, implying that they were the result of childlike fantasies rather than deliberate actions. He said that Mary's notes were meant to draw attention rather than indicate any criminal intent. In his closing declaration, Rudolph Lyons characterized the case as macabre and grotesque, depicting Mary as the more dominant despite her youth exerting a strong influence over Norma, whom he described as having below average intelligence. Lyons focused on Mary's lies to the police and lack of remorse, emphasizing her clever personality. The trial lasted nine days, and the jury deliberated for more than three hours before providing their verdict. Mary was cleared for ending two lives, but found guilty of murder due to her reduced involvement in both sons' deaths. Norma was relieved when she was cleared of all charges while Mary broke down in tears. In sentencing, Mr. Justice Cusack labeled Bell as a dangerous individual, stating she posed a very grave risk to other children and that measures must be taken to protect the public from her. She was sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, effectively an indefinite sentence of imprisonment. At the time of Bell's manslaughter convictions, she was just 11 years and six months old, making her Britain youngest female murderer, a record that still stands today. Mary Bell was initially imprisoned in a Durham jail home before being transferred to a second remand home in South Norwood. She was then sent to the Red Bank Secure Facility, where she claimed to have been violated by a staff member and other inmates since she was 13 years old. She was sent to a secure wing of HM Prison Style in Cheshire in November 1973 when she was 16 years old. She unsuccessfully requested release and indicated her dissatisfaction with the transfer. Mary Bell was sent to Moore Court Open Prison in June 1976 when she enrolled in a secretarial course. 15 months later, in September 1977, Bell and Annette Priest made global headlines when they escaped from the open jail. They spent several days in Blackpool with two males visiting amusement parks and staying at local hotels. Bell went by the nickname Mary Robinson at this time and colored her hair blonde to hide herself. On September 13th, Bell was apprehended at one of the men's residences in Derbyshire and subsequently returned to prison. Her escape resulted in a 28-day suspension of jail privileges. The following day, there's an incident involving a girl, a seven-year-old girl called Pauline Watson. In June 1979, 
the Home Office made a decision that would change Mary Bell's life. They decided to move her to HM Prison Askham Grange, an open category prison in the village of Askham Richard. The goal was to prepare her for her eventual release into society, which was planned for the following year. Starting in November 1979, Bell began working first as a secretary, then as a waitress at a cafe in York Minster under supervision guidelines. This was all part of the plan to prepare her for her eventual release. Mary Bell was freed from HM Prison Askham Grange in May 1980, age 23, after serving near nearly 11 and a half years in prison. She was given a new identity, allowing her to start a new life in another area of the country. Bell emphasized her desire to have a normal life and asked to be left alone. Four years later, on May 25th, 1984, Bell gave birth to her only daughter. Her daughter was unaware of her mother's past until 1998, when reporters found them in a resort town on the Sussex coast, where they had been living for nearly 18 months. Undercover officers transferred Bell and her 14-year-old daughter to a safe house and then to another region of the United Kingdom to ensure their safety. There have been rumors that Bell has returned to Tyneside several times in the years following her release. It's also rumored that she lived in this location for a while. The right to anonymity granted to Bell's daughter following her birth was originally only extended until she reached the age of 18. However, on May 21st, 2003, Bell won a high court battle to have her own anonymity and that of her daughter extended for life. This order was approved by Dame Elizabeth Butler Sloss, president of the family division, and was later updated to include Bell's granddaughter, who was referred to as Z. The order also prohibits the divulging of any aspects of their lives that may identify them. In 1998, Bell collaborated with author Gita Sereny to provide an account of her life before and after her crimes for Sereny's 1998 book, Cries Unheard, The Story of Mary Bell. In this book, Belle details the torture she suffered as a child at the hands of her mother, whom she describes as a dominatrix, and she alleges several of her mother's clients. Others interviewed include relatives, friends, and professionals who knew her before, during, and after her imprisonment. Belle's current whereabouts are unknown and remain protected by the 2003 High Court order. According to Sereny, Bell does not claim she was wrongly convicted and freely admits that the torture she suffered as a child does not excuse her crimes. The chilling tale of Mary Bell comes to a close, but the questions remain. What led a young girl to commit such horrifying acts? Could anything have been done to prevent this tragedy? And what does this case teach us about the nature of evil? Is it born or is it made? Hit that subscribe button for more thrilling stories.